You're listening to the Doonstief Audio Fiction Magazine. And now here's your host, Rich Outfield. Ah, oh, the Parsec Award nominations are coming out soon. Any day now, really. Boy, what I wouldn't do to get a nomination this year. Why, uh, I'd sell my soul for a Parsec nomination. <laughs> what the hell? Interesting you would put it that way, lad. Oh my god! Not quite, young outfield. Wait a minute. Sean Connery? Well, not exactly. But the devil has been known to take on a pleasing shape. And how? Would you rather I appear as something different? Say, Phoebe Cates, circa Fast Times at Ridgemont High, or Wendy Jo Sperber, circa Back to the Future? No, no, tempting. But no, very well. Well, hey, hey, I gotta congratulate you on this one, Mr. Connery. Or, should I say, Satan. Please, call me Lou. <laughs> okay, come on, give me a cool Connery quote. Maybe one about the penitent man, or... Or something about pussy galore, or, or maybe look. I'm not a bloody monkey dancing for your amusement. Uh, how about the one about a wop bringing a knife to a gun? Stop! If there's one thing I can't stand, it's racial slurs. Remember who you're talking to. Uh, I'm sorry. Now, I came here for one reason and one reason only. You said something about a parsec nomination, and a soul. Right. Uh, I guess I did. Now, I'd be willing to pull a couple of strings if you would be willing to sign a little contract, one that I just happen to have in my jacket here. How does it work? It's an article of clothing you wear to protect yourself from the elements, but that's not important right now. What you must do is trade your immortal soul to eternal enslavement to me, Lucifer, in Lou. Right, Lou. But this contract is binding and extremely legal. Believe me, I'm surrounded by lawyers day and night. I can imagine. So, I've got to ask you one question. Are you sure this is what you want? Well, if I had a parsec, dibby 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 dum. All week long I never would get bored If I had a parsec ward The Doonstief staff would work hard Stop! Stop! No singing for the love of... Well, you know. Topol? No more singing, Rish. I'm serious. Wow. You and announcer man would get along really well. No doubt. We'll be seeing a great deal of one another in the not-too-distant future. Oh. So, Rish, I have decided to alter the deal. Oh, pray I don't alter it any further. What? It's from Star Wars. D don't you have that where you come from? Well, we have the prequels. But listen, in addition to your soul, I require that you never sing again on your show. What? Never? No, never. What? Never? No, never. Not ever! Shut up, you! If you make this vow, a parsec is as good as yours. Wow, really? You'd do this? Indeed. I'm not convinced. Do you think you might sing a little song about it? A song? Like, perhaps, a play on the Ursula song from Little Mermaid? <laughs> that would be cool. Yes, it would. Well, the temptation is great, young Outfield, but that's usually my territory, so no. Ah, shut up, you. Now sign the contract. Gladly. <laughs> oh, why did you laugh like that? Well, it's how I imagine Sean Connery would laugh if he were... No, 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 no. I mean, why did you laugh after I signed? Oh, you'll find out. In time. Uh, I don't like the sound of that. Wait till you taste it, my boy. Well, 
at least I'll have a Parsec award. You know, that has to taste pretty sweet, don't you uh, think? Uh, uh, uh. Your contract was for a Parsec nomination, not for the award itself. What? You tricked me. Unthinkable. What a jip. Hey, what did I tell you about racial slurs? I'm sorry. For you to actually win the Parsec, we'd have to amend your contract. Say, throw in the life of your biggest fan. What, like Nigel? Oh, I'm way ahead of you on that one, boy. Oh, so, like, like Wendy Cooper? Yes. And done. And Morgan Elect. Done and done. And the life of, say, Big Anklovich's unborn child. His wife is pregnant again? Son of a... What do you say, Rish Benjamin Outfield? Shall I remove my pen? Hey, what kind of sketch is this? Pen. I said pen. Oh. Come on, my lad. Make your choice. You're a very busy man and you haven't got all day? Right you are. It won't cost much. Just my... Stop that. Well, I... I'd like to. Really, I would. Well, then shine. Nobody has to know it. You've only got... What? Eighteen listeners? Sixteen. Shy. Shoot, I can't. I just, I can't have any more blood on my hands. Not after Anna Nicole Smith, Osama bin Laden, and John Benet Ramsey. Very well. There's always next year. Yeah, if I'm around that long. I couldn't have said it better myself. Goodbye, Rish Outfield. Goodbye, Satan, doing a fairly poor Sean Connery impression. And now here's your host, Big Anklevich. Rish? Rish, what are you doing? Huh? Jeez, it smells like brimstone in here. You really ought to take some Metamucil with dinner or something. What? Oh, sorry, Big. You'll never believe it. The Parsec nominations came out, and... We're on there? Oh, yes, we are. We got... Three nominations. Three? Three. Wow. Atta boy, Lucifer. You're the best. And you're, and you're the, the man, man now, now dog. dog. Awesome. What the hell? Uh, I'll tell you about it later. Let's go start the show. <laughs> Maybe we should move along to the story now. Go ahead and say it, man. I know you want to. Welcome. It's not exactly it, but okay. See what the kutli Ah, See what you did there? <laughs> Welcome to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. That's right. I'm Big Anklevich. And I'm Rish Outfield. And this is episode 109. Hmm. I know. It's weird that we switched <laughs> on that. I like the time we switched wives. Mm -hmm. But that's a conversation for another story. Wait, you liked it especially time. because I was the only one that had a wife. I did like that. <laughs> I understand that you rocked gently in your very big <laughs> empty bed for hours. Today we've got another in a series. Now how do we do this two in a row? Well, that's good. Series is, is, is are fun. What are fun, sir? Series is, is. I'm sorry, what, what, one more time? <laughs> one more time for the judges here. <laughs> series is... is. Oh, I think there was a real word in there somewhere. My mom snuck in disguised as the uh, Russian judge and gave me a six. Must, <laughs> must have been the dismount. <laughs> that, is, that is good stuff. Today, Ed, we've got a returning writer. He's, uh, he's, he's written to us before. His name is Joshua Reynolds. Yes, you are correct, sir. And uh, this is really, this is wild, but... Uh, the story is The Strange Affair of the Sundered Man. That's right. And this is the third Ulrich Popoka story we've done on our show. Wow. Is it fair to say Ulrich Popoka story, or what would you call this? Yeah, I think you'd, you'd have to go there, because um, you could have said the other stories were Popoka and Felucci stories, but uh, yeah. this particular case, Felucci doesn't make an appearance. And I, I believe there's another story in this series that's out there that includes Felucci, but not, not Popoka. Popoka. So what would you call the four stories? They're all strange affair of something, so you could say they're the strange affairs. Okay, uh, that works. The strange affairs of Joshua Reynolds. 
if you'd like to check out those other stories, how about if you put a link to the other two stories in the show notes? I can most definitely do that. Also, if you're an enterprising young man, you could go down the links that we have along the right side of the page, and you will find a link to Joshua Reynolds. And all the stories that Joshua Reynolds has put on our show will appear in that. Okay, and who produced this episode? Today's episode was produced by Rich Girardi. In a hurry. And music and all that stuff in the show notes? The music is in the show notes. So, hey, tell me a little bit about uh, Mr. Reynolds. Sure. Joshua M. Reynolds is a freelance writer of moderate skill and exceptional confidence. Hmm. He has written a bit, and some of it was even published for money. By real people. His work has appeared in anthologies such as Permuted Press's Cthulhu Unbound 2 and in Woodland Press's Spectres in Coal Dust. Feel free to stop by his blog. Joshua M. Reynolds. <laughs> yes. And cast aspersions on his character. I will. All right. And now, on with the show. It's about bloody time. The Strange Affair of the Sundered Man by Joshua Reynolds. Good evening, Constable Frogmore. Ulrich Popoka, ambassador to the court of Victoria Gloriana Regina of United Britain from the Nahuatl people, said. He dabbed at his lips with a napkin and gestured to the teapot sitting on the table between he and his guest. Do help yourself to some tea. No tea. Constable Frogmore grunted. His flat, pudgy face was twisted in a grimace. Popoka smiled and dropped his napkin on the crumb-laden plate in front of him. Then why have you come to visit, Constable? Division 13... Yes? Popoka leaned forward, his axe-blade nose twitching slightly. The constable's grimace was transformed into something altogether different. One meaty hand thumped the table. You... Frogmore began, face flushed. Popoka stiffened, frowning. Yes? He said again coldly. You have something to say, constable? Frogmore sat back, his face moving through varying apoplectic shades before settling on a deep, heart-clenching purple. Then the color abruptly faded... Frogmore stood, releasing a harsh exhalation of breath. Uh, nothing at all, Ambassador. I'm sorry to have troubled you, he said. Oh, sit down, Constable, Popoka said irritably. He slapped the table for emphasis. Obviously you have a problem, otherwise you wouldn't have accosted me at my evening tea. Frogmore sat, his bulky gorilla frame looking ill-placed in the delicate surroundings of the rooftop garden of the embassy. In contrast to the stocky policeman, the ambassador was tall and slender and fragile-looking and looked perfectly at home amongst the curly, fleshy-leafed trees drooping over the two men. Somewhere, a waterfall burbled, courtesy of a Tesla brand generator. Popoka looked away from the tight-lipped constable, letting his gaze play across the city. London was all dark buildings and industry smog, a morass of creeping stone and metal and wood. Every corner stank of soot and oil, and its people breathed in tallow and other equally pungent effluvium of progress. Clockwork horses pulled brass carriages through narrow streets, and the shadows of gas bag dirigibles fell over the rooftops like storm clouds. It was so unlike home that it hurt. Home was gold and green and living. England, Europe for that matter, was dead and buried beneath brick and iron. Popoka stroked the golden half-mask that hid his tax scars and wondered if Frogmore was looking at his reflection in the mask's polished surface. Most people did. They couldn't help it. Popoka turned back and smiled as Frogmore's eyes looked away hurriedly. It's the Nasiatal, Constable. Taxes. We pay them, just like you. Only my government takes flesh instead of gold. We have so much gold, after all. But only a little flesh. Popoka said, relishing the brief flare of disgust that burned in Frogmore's eyes. Now, are you going to tell me what you wanted? You, or rather that mind of yours, Frogmore said. Popoka blinked. You mean you want my help? No, but my superiors think we might need it. 
And you. You're a heathen wog, Frogmore said. And if you wasn't an ambassador, I'd... But I am. So you won't, Popoka said. So, when you say superiors... He trailed off, leaving the rest unspoken. Frogmore shifted uncomfortably. This ain't club business, he said, licking his lips. Popoka let out a breath he hadn't realized he'd been holding. He'd been hoping that was the case. The club referred to the Diogenes Club, an organization no one could admit existed, even though it plainly did. He dealt with the club's schemes on several occasions. None of them had been pleasant. Memorable, though. Good. Glad to hear it, he said. Frogmore relaxed slightly. He appeared as relieved as Popoka felt. Then it's Division 13 that wants my services. Not officially. Of course not. I am the representative of a foreign power, after all. Yes. Frogmore chewed the word a bit before he spit it out. Nonetheless. He looked out at the city, a dour northern gargoyle. A fellow has been sundered down at Street Theater in the West End. Frogmore gestured, drawing a finger down the middle of his face, top to bottom. Surely you don't need my help with a murder. Popoka began. Frogmore laughed, a sudden harsh bray. (laughs) Nail on the head there. See, he ain't deceased. What? Not deceased. It's the Queen's English, ain't it? Means not dead. Thank you, Constable. I gathered such. Popoka said. Cut in half, but not dead. My, my, my. Are you sure this isn't the... It ain't club business. Frogmore snarled. Popoka sat back and interlaced his fingers beneath his sharp chin. Not just yet, at any rate, eh? Popoka smiled. That's what this is about. You don't actually want my help, do you, Constable? You just want to crack the case before the club decides to turn its monolithic attentions upon it. Fine! Damn your eyes, fine! Frogmore said. He jabbed at Popoka with a finger. And so? You got no more cause to love them than a stout yard. Less, I should dare say. Then you'll help? Yes, but only because I want to see this amazing affair for myself. Popoka stood and pulled at his startlingly blue waistcoat, straightening it. As always, he was dressed in the best Savile Row had to offer though the colors were not their usual mixture of blacks, browns, and grays. Rather, Popoka insisted on the proper, traditional colors of home. This one was colored a bright, tropical yellow that threatened the retinas of anyone who looked at him for too long. Frogmore, in marked contrast, was dressed in a dull-colored uniform, resplendent with brass, spit-polished buttons, and a constable's helmet under one big arm. Popoka waved aside the Kuchikwe, who made to accompany them downstairs. The scar-faced, shaven-headed warriors wore dark uniforms based somewhat on the constable's own, but their buttons were not brass, but gold, and each was carved in the shape of a particular Nawadal god or goddess. They carried ceremonial obsidian knives on their belts and Alfgear cylinder revolvers low on their hips, Vinlander fashion. Neither looked happy at the gesture, but they didn't follow Popoka and Frogmore down from the rooftop garden. Hard-faced fuckers. Frogmore sounded almost admiring. Popoka smiled. Warrior societies have their uses, he said lightly. Frogmore grunted. Hmm. Heard they're cannibals. Really? So have I. Popoka said. We do so try and keep those types at home, though. Bad press, you understand. Yeah. Frogmore blinked as if unsure whether Popoka were joking or not. Popoka smiled. So, a theater in the West End, you said? Lyceum. Frogmore said. Popoka clapped his hands. <laughs> How delightful. It sounds magical. It's not. But... It sounds so, and perception is so much more important than reality, Constable. Only to you heathen bastards from across the ocean. Frogmore sounded confident in his assertion, as only an Englishman could be. Popoka shrugged and let it go. The first time he'd met the Constable, he'd realized it was futile to argue with him. There was a model Tesla Velocipede waiting on them outside the gates of the embassy, a nervous-looking patrolman sitting behind the wheel. Like Frogmore, he had a brass 13 emblazoned on his helmet. The theater, Perkins. Frogmore grunted once they were in. Wellington Street. Ah! Perkins bleated and fiddled with the gear shifts, thrusting the vehicle into motion as the electrical engine cycled to life. The Tesla bumbled through the streets of the West End like a drunken beast, taking corners with scraping closeness and rumbling over potholes with bad grace. Popoka, for his part, hated the machines. The English, most of Europe, in fact were enamored of the latest toys to come out of the electric duchy in Duke Tesla's labs. Industry clogged the continent, choking the sky with black clouds and filling the streets with ash and waste. It would be a dark day for home when the slow-moving bureaucracy of the Nawadal finally allowed Tesla's representatives, or those of similar ilk, inland. The day was coming when automatons and electric beasts would replace the quiet beauty of the jungle and the calmer forests of the north. 
Popoka closed his eyes as his stomach lurched. Yet another reason to hate the things. Sensitive nose and stomach did not a happy passenger make. He opened an eye to find Frogmore grinning at him. Enjoying the ride? If I said no, would you let me walk? No. Then yes. Very much, thanks. Frogmore frowned and turned back, glaring out at the street. Popoka grimaced as his stomach gurgled again. They remained silent until they reached the Lyceum. It was a modest building with columns out front, a peaked Roman roof, and 2,000 seats, ranging from proletariat to bourgeois in pricing. Popoka had heard it burn down once, but then most of the buildings in London had. Frogmore slammed his door and stomped towards the steps, bulldog posture instantly alerting and scattering the gathered rubberneckers. Popoka followed more sedately, his cane tap-tapping. The people milling around outside were mostly well-dressed, fashionable theater-goers out for an evening on the town. He recognized a few, guests at various parties, people who did some business with the Empire. Some called out to him, but a querulous grunt from Frogmore pulled him up the steps and away from the crowd before he could make any attempt at conversation. We aren't here to chat, Ambassador. Frogmore put special emphasis on the last word. Popoka snorted. Chatting is often the best way to figure out exactly what occurred, Constable. So is seeing the scene, I understand. Point taken. Lay on. Popoka gestured with his cane. Frogmore snapped an order at the two uniforms guarding the door to the theater, and they fell over themselves to open the fancy double doors. Inside, Popoka wasn't surprised to see more of Frogmore's men guarding the hall to the theater proper. Young, dutiful-looking men, shiny and starched. Frogmore was the oldest man in the division, a grizzled veteran of the Martian incursions of 1880 and the Anglo-Spanish War of five years previous to that. Popoka wondered who had chosen Frogmore for his post and why. Answers would likely never be forthcoming, given Frogmore's personal feelings on foreigners in general, and Popoka himself in particular. The constable had never forgiven him for interfering in the Whitechapel investigations. Popoka felt a tingle on his arm where the scars of the beast which his teeth still lingered. He pushed aside the memories of that ugly night, the rain and the rooftop and the hot stink of jaguar that filled his nostrils. Coming or not? Frogmore barked, holding a door open. Popoka shook himself, realizing he'd fallen behind. He hurried to catch up, trying to look like he was doing anything but. Wouldn't do to give Frogmore the satisfaction. Welcome to the Lyceum, Frogmore said, sweeping out a meaty arm in a grandiose gesture. And if you can figure out what's going on, Ambassador, I'll kiss your heathen idols. There was the emphasis again. Popoka didn't rise to the bait, but threw out some of his own instead. And earn the wrath of the gods? Thanks all the same, Constable, but no thanks. You- Popoka ignored him and stepped into the auditorium, cane tips sinking into the lush carpeting. The Lyceum could see 2,000, and it showed. Baroque balconies jutted from crimson walls, gilded cherubs played silent instruments, faces frozen in grotesque parodies of rapture. Popoka let his eyes drift up and up to the mural on the ceiling, a strange mishmash of images that barely made any sense. He shook his head and looked toward the stage. The sundered man stood on one leg in the center of the stage, single arm hanging limp. Popoka blinked and licked his lips. Goodness, he said. Frogmore stalked past him. Anything but. The constable's voice sounded tinny and strange in the cavernous auditorium. Popoka followed him toward the stage. The night had been cool, but the Lyceum's interior was warm, heated by the latest steam generators. But the stage was cold. The cold that was the absolute absence of heat, the emptiness at the ocean's bottom. Popoka shivered as he stepped up on stage, his cane tap-tapping on the hard wood. Pausing at the top of the steps, he swallowed thickly, a sudden burst of nausea flashing through his belly and fading. The sundered man made a horrible, light rasping sound, a whisper of ugly noise, a sucking, flexing sound that seemed to echo from everywhere and nowhere. Split down the middle, crown to crotch, what there was of him was dressed to the height of fashion, cravat and spats, and somewhere in the vast sea of seats that extended away from the stage was probably a top hat and cane to match. His arm, a thin, shriveled stick, hung limp at his side, and his head, loose white hairs all out of place, was bowed slightly. Popoka sidled around him, moving in front of the bifurcated figure, his skin crawling. The man's face was unrecognizable, a half-moon of pale meat and one partially closed eye that flickered like the mind behind it was caught in a particularly nasty dream. Every so often, his fingers twitched and jerked. Popoka moved further, eyes narrowing as he examined the empty, raw redness on the other side. The sundered man's lung flexed, repeating the sucking noise that Popoka had heard moments earlier. A quiet pum-pum-pum gave evidence that half a heart still beat. Popoka reached a hand out, but stopped short of touching the single lobe of brain that remained. How did it happen? His breath blossomed and pooled around his face as he spoke. Frogmore was watching him a few feet away. 
Ask him, Frogmore said, flicking a finger towards two of his men, who held the third between them. Popoka looked at the man, a pudgy, bloat-faced man with an ugly mustache and dressed far too fancily for him to pull it off. And he is? Grimbaldi! Lupino Grimbaldi! The pudgy man fairly shrieked. And I am an Italian citizen of a... No, you're not. Popoka poked the man with his cane. Your accent is obviously phony. You smell of fish oil and silk cuts, and you're as pale as a corpse. You're English. I am a... From Manchester. And you know that how? Frogmore grumbled. Popoka shrugged. The accent beneath the garlic. So, man can be from Manchester? Is that crime? Grimbaldi muttered, sagging slightly in the grip of the two constables. Frogmore frowned. No, but cutting a man in bleeding half certainly is. I didn't kill him, Grimbaldi protested. I've used your cabinet a hundred times and it never... What cabinet? Popoka asked. Frogmore gestured. That piece of shit over there. Just a box as far as we can tell. That's why I'm here though, ain't it? Popoka said. To see what I can tell. Frogmore didn't reply. Popoka took that as a good sign and stepped toward the cabinet. Taller than him by only a few inches. Brightly painted, thin wooden walls enclosing a space big enough for one person. He tapped on it with his cane, looking for the false panels. There was always a false panel. Only this time, there wasn't. Popoka blinked and checked again. No panel. The hairs on his neck stood on end. He opened the cabinet carefully and his nose wrinkled as a smell like an abattoir floor wafted over him. No blood, however. He stepped back and glanced at the sundered man. No blood there either. Popoka stepped into the box. He heard Frogmore shout and the stomp of feet across the stage. Get out of there! Now, now, constable. You said yourself you didn't find anything. Popoka, cane resting in the crook of his arm, began to run his hands across the interior of the cabinet. Frogmore looked inside, face going purple. Doesn't mean there's not a bloody booby trap in here. True, which is why I'm investigating. Popoka carefully ran his fingers along the top of the cabinet. Something clicked. Ah. Popoka leapt out of the cabinet as a mirrored panel slid down, thudding home into an unnoticeable groove on the floor, splitting the interior of the box into two equal halves. What was the trick, Mr. Grimbaldi? Sound activates it, I presume? Popoka asked. What? Grimbaldi looked confused. Popoka waved a hand towards the cabinet. The trick? What was it? A simple vanishing? Or something else? I, uh... Grimbaldi looked at Frogmore and hesitated. Frogmore raised a fist. Answer him! I cut him in half! Whoever steps in the box, the panel cuts him in half and one half vanishes. It's Egyptian! It's Turkish. How do you know that? Frogmore threw a suspicious glare at Popoka. The ambassador shrugged and tapped the outside of the box with his cane. The writing on the sides. It's a Turkish puzzle box. Popoka turned to Grimbaldi. How many times have you performed this trick? Oh, a few hundred times. Grimbaldi was pale and sweating. I bought it off a walk in Istanbul. Tell me exactly what happened. I invited a volunteer up from the audience. A plant? Popoka asked. Grimbaldi shook his head. No, never. I don't use plants. Devil, you say. Frogmore said. Grimbaldi glared at him, cheeks puffing out in indignation. I don't, I don't need a... Grimbaldi's mouth snapped shut. Popoka leaned close. You don't need what? A plant? Why? It really works. Grimbaldi said softly. He looked at the cabinet, eyes blinking rapidly. I didn't know it when I bought it, but it works. Only this time it didn't. Not all the way. <sighs> he swallowed air, mouth opening and closing. I can do it without looking now, you know? And I did. And when I opened it this time, it helped him. Out there. <laughs> His voice became shrill and spiraled up into silence. Frogmore stepped forward, grabbing the smaller man by his shirt front. How do you reverse it then, eh? How do you undo it? I did! I did it just like I always did it! Four wraps to the four points! Same as to do the trick! Obviously not, if it didn't work. Popoka scratched his chin and gazed at the cabinet. Constable, who did you say our sundered man is? I didn't. Frogmore said. Well? You don't need to know who he was, is, to figure this out. Frogmore's tone was unmistakable. Popoka glanced at him. I thought you said this wasn't a club affair, Constable. It ain't. It's ours. Frogmore turned away from Grimbaldi. You're here to help us figure out what happened. That's it. And to do that, I need all the facts. Then you've got all you need. Frogmore rumbled. He stepped towards Popoka and the ambassador stepped back, eyes narrowing. Then, with a swirl of his canary-colored coat, Popoka stepped around Frogmore into the side of the sundered man. The face, what there was of it, was barely familiar. What caught Popoka's eyes, though, was a green and gold lapel pin, a stylized stag picked out on the surface. Only a few men in the British Empire had one of those. Popoka filed the information away as he turned back to Frogmore. I didn't notice it before. Only half a face, you see. I think I recognize him from a party at the palace. He's... None of your concern! Frogmore bellowed. Popoka smiled. A peer of the realm, 
I was going to say. Well, don't. I was wrong before. This is political. Popoka twirled his cane. How thrilling. Oh, I shouldn't have brought you here. Frogmore began, but Popoka cut him off with a bark <laughs> of laughter. You didn't have a choice, though, did you? Who is he? Someone important. Frogmore said truculently. That's all I can say. It might be important. Popoka wheedled. Motivation and such. He's part of an investigation by the Yard. He's got information. Information someone might want to kill him for? I... Frogmore began. I didn't do it on purpose! Grimbaldi yelped, struggling in the grip of the officers who held him. It wasn't my fault! It wasn't- Shut him up! Frogmore snapped. Popoka turned back to the box. He had seen similar curious cabinets in his theater going over the years, but none quite like this. It was, despite all appearances to the contrary, too finely made to have been for sale in some back alley somewhere. It was, in fact, a highly complex engine of the hypothetical, something that whoever had sold it would know. Popoka frowned and tapped his lips with the head of his cane. A sudden thought came to him. He turned, pointing at Grimbaldi with his cane. Constable, how many nights has our conjurer here played to this house? He... Frogmore blinked. Hmm. He turned and hoisted Grimbaldi up by his cravat. Well, how many nights? One! Grimbaldi licked his plump lips, eyes darting nervously. Popoka nodded. And I'm willing to bet that before tonight, you performed at one of these shoddier joints, yes? Oh, yeah. Of course you did. Your clothes are shiny with wear, your stage makeup is minimal at best, and your shoes are dreadful. And there's the matter of the promotional poster, of course. Whoa! Frogmore looked confused. Popoka gestured towards the doors. The posters outside, the ones that advertised the evening's performance, Constable. They were not for Grimbaldi. It was the opportunity of a lifetime, Grimbaldi said, struggling in Frogmore's grips. I couldn't pass it up. Of course you couldn't. And you were so grateful that you even let them examine your wondrous cabinet, yes? Popoka leaned close to the little man, his voice soft. You have no idea how it actually works, do you? So, of course, you wouldn't know if someone tampered with it, say. Grimbaldi's eyes filled with hot tears and he looked away. Popoka's eyes narrowed. Frogmore made to shake the conjurer when the sundered man gave a sudden groan. It was a peculiar sound, half of what it should have been, yet still deeper and wider than any noise made by a human throat. All eyes turned towards the limp half-figure standing at the center of the stage. Slowly, with an agonizing grace, the sundered man turned, the sound still drizzling from his bifurcated mouth. His hand reached out towards them, fingers fluttering like the legs of some pale insect. Good God, Frogmore muttered, stepping back. Popoka breathed a quick prayer of his own. An atavistic impulse demanded that he unsheathe the slim sword hidden within his cane, but he resisted. Grimbaldi sank to his knees, gibbering mindlessly. The other constables gazed in stupefied horror as the sundered man took a step, and from somewhere out of the ether, its twin echoed like thunder. They heard it then as the footstep faded, a harsh whine that echoed as from a great distance. It grew into a slavering yell, the sound of a hunting hound on the scent. Popoka looked up. God! What? Perkins, seal the doors! Use the six sand markings! Frogmore snarled, ignoring Popoka. The young constable snapped a ragged salute and fairly scrambled for the doors. Popoka watched him go and then turned as the sundered man took another step. He's trying to get to the cabinet! Popoka glanced at Frogmore meaningfully. The constable's broad face was fairly squirming with an expression Popoka had never seen on it before. Constable, keep, keep him away from it! Frogmore barked, gesturing towards the other constables. Just don't touch him! Frogmore. Quiet! Frogmore snapped. Popoka jerked back as if stung. The bestial noise sounded again, echoing eerily within the auditorium. Popoka thought for a moment of the jaguars of home and the sounds they made on the hunt. Then he grasped the head of his cane and drew the hidden blade with a flourish, pressing the tip to Frogmore's throat. Frogmore froze. Constable, I must insist. You stupid... Tut tut, my dear sir. Name calling will get you nowhere. Popoka jabbed lightly with his sword, forcing Frogmore back a step. Then another. Call off your men, Frogmore. I wish to see the end of this puzzle. Do you hear those sounds, you bloody wog? Frogmore rumbled, licking his lips, his eyes narrowing to glittering slits. If those things get through... Then you'll be here to stop them, I presume. We can't stop them, Frogmore said bluntly. Dr. D himself couldn't stop them things. Popoka felt a chill crawl up his spine as the otherworldly howl sounded again, closer this time. The sundered man stumble walked past him, unfocused eye darting back and forth in a parody of panic. Grimbaldi, help him into the cabinet. Grimbaldi shook his head, mouth open, no sound coming out. Popoka cursed and directed Frogmore towards the cabinet. You do it then. No way in hell or heaven, you heathen fool. Frogmore crossed his arms. Popoka hissed in frustration. We can't simply let this man die at the talons of, of whatever those ethereal horrors are. We can and we bloody will. Frogmore's face was pallid. Sweat beaded at the corners of his mouth and forehead. I have a 
duty to the queen. The sundered man moaned as he clambered into the cabinet, his body sliding easily into the appropriate compartment, his raw open side pressing to the strange mirrored surface, his fingers clawing uselessly at the cabinet doors trying to close them. He moved as if underwater, his lips flapping, his lung flexing and swelling with a horrible sound. Popoka looked back at Frogmore and then darted towards the cabinet, tossing aside his blade as he lunged to close the doors. A gust of cool, flaccid air coiled around him like the breath of some looming beast, and the bloody smell was stronger, a rancid stench that made his stomach heave. Panic swelling in his breast, Popoka slammed the doors with a raised hand. Four wraps, Grimbaldi had said, one at each compass point. Westerners went north to west normally, so to reverse the process... Popoka rapped at the westernmost corner of the cabinet first, then the east, then south, all the while trying to ignore the shaking of the room around him as the auditorium shuddered beneath the tread of the hunting horror that stalked the sundered man. As he made to wrap the northern corner, something caught him on the shoulder, sending him spinning to the stage. Pain flared through him as he realized that he'd been shot. Grimbaldi, a heretofore concealed pepper box clutched in one hand, swung the stubby pistol towards Frogmore. The little magician was no longer a blubbering bag of suet. His pudgy face transformed into a determined mask as the pistol spoke again. A quiet chuff and Frogmore staggered back, clutching at his thigh. Couldn't just leave it alone, could ya? Grimbaldi snarled, swinging the pistol towards the other officers. Stay back, lads. I got two more shots and I'm a dead hand with a peppy. Who? Frogmore hissed. Popoka laughed bitterly. <laughs> as I suspected. Oh, really? Grimbaldi said, a smile curling at the edge of his lips. Popoka sat up, clutching his bleeding shoulder. Of course. This whole thing smacks of duplicity. Where is poor Signor Grimbaldi, then? Floating in the Thames somewhere. Doesn't matter now, does it? Grimbaldi, or whoever he was, looked up with a satisfied smirk as the padding thunder of the hunting horror grew closer yet. From in the cabinet, the sundered man tried to scream. It's almost over. Wouldn't it have been easier to simply shoot him? Popoka asked. His eyes flickered towards the discarded blade, laying only inches away. If he could... Wouldn't have been half as poetic, though, I must say. I saw the little wop do a show on the docks, and I knew. I knew it was perfect. Who the bloody hell are you? Frogmore growled. The pudgy <laughs> man laughed. My name's Dyson. And that fancy man in there? He's getting what he deserves right enough. I see no brand on your cheek. So I assume it was... What? A brother? Popoka said. Dyson blinked. Cousin. Well, it's close as. What the hell are you talking about? Frogmore said. Popoka gestured at the cabinet. Our sundered man is a member of the Fellowship of Hearn, Constable. Didn't you notice his lapel pin? Frogmore was silent, but the implication was clear. Popoka felt a quiver of satisfaction. Dyson nodded. Bastards offer debt as a purse if they'll volunteer for a hunt out in the country. The posh fuckers hunt those poor swords like foxes. But they don't usually kill them, do they? They just brand them. Popoka shook his head. This time, though, they did, didn't they, Dyson? The only question I have is how you knew about the cabinet, about what it led to. You think only rich bastards can learn them ungovernable mysteries? Dyson grinned. It was a feral expression, cunning. Man can learn a lot living in London. There are other clubs than just the Ernie's. Indeed. Popoka said. The stage was shuddering beneath him. His blade quivered where it lay. I was about to say the same thing. Constable, now! Dyson whirled, cursing. Frogmore stumbled back, glaring at Popoka in shock. Popoka rolled towards the cabinet and gave it the last rap required to activate it. It began to hum, and Dyson gave a strangled shriek. His yelp was echoed by the bellow of the ethereal thing that had been on the Sundered Man's train. The frustrated howl resounded from ceiling to floor, bouncing around and around, and then slowly fading away like the last vestiges of a storm. Dyson stumbled towards the cabinet, as if intent on stopping it. Frogmore lurched towards him and grabbed him from behind, clawing for the pistol. Popoka stepped aside and scooped up his sword with his good arm, swinging the point around to prick Dyson's cheek. That's enough, chum. Drop the peppy. Dyson glared at Popoka, but the gun slipped from his fingers regardless. Frogmore wrestled him down with a pained grunt. The cabinet had ceased humming and instead shook slightly as if someone were trying to get out. Well, open the damn box! Frogmore snapped, looking at the other two constables. Popoka laughed, then winced as his shoulder flared. Glad you're finally seeing things my way, Constable. You shut up. Frogmore barked, pointing a stubby finger. You're nothing but trouble, you are. You're the one who invited me. Ah, I was right. Popoka turned as the cabinet was opened, and the thin man, formerly sundered, now whole once more, nearly fell out, his eyes wild. Sir Danvers Carew, member of the Lords, member in good standing of the Fellowship of Hearn, and very nearly a meal for... For what was that thing? You don't need to know. Frogmore stood, one hand still pressed tightly to his thigh. Popoka snorted. Of course not. 
I wasn't even here, was I? No, not if you know what's good for you, you weren't. Of course. Popoka groaned and looked at his shoulder. The bullet had just grazed him, but it still hurt like blazes. All the same, I would like to go back to the embassy now. What? Our doctor's not good enough for you? Frankly, no. Popoka said, one hand pressed tight against his shoulder. Frogmore sniffed and looked <laughs> down at Dyson. The pudgy man spat and glared up at the constable and the ambassador. Then he looked at Carew, shock-headed and dead-eyed, where he sat on the edge of the open cabinet. Dyson laughed, a wet, <laughs> nasty sound. He knows what it's like to be hunted now, sure enough. Oh, yes. Yes. Popoka looked at Carew and swallowed the sudden bile that rose in his throat. He looked at Frogmore. The government doesn't approve of the fellowship, I understand. They've been looking for a reason to have its charter revoked. A death, and evidence to that effect from a member in good standing like Sir Danvers would be quite... That's not your concern, Frogmore said quietly. Popoka sheathed his blade and leaned heavily on the cane. Of course not. I am the representative of a foreign power, after all. Popoka smiled and started for the door. Then, abruptly, he turned back, looking thoughtful. Still, I wonder who got Grimbaldi, or Dyson, rather, into the Lyceum. And who told him how to do what he did? Frogmore frowned, his brow furrowing. What are you trying to... Imply? Nothing. Nothing at all, Constable. Popoka said... Simply theorizing that what is, and what ain't, club business, ain't always clear. Then, coat folded neatly over one arm, he walked out of the theater. Stepping down the stairs into the cool London evening, he slid back into his coat with a wince and looked up at the dark sky. Something indefinable passed between his eyes and the stars, and he thought he heard the faintest sound of some great padding beast in the distance. With a shiver, he began to walk as fast as his long, lean legs could carry him, and as much as the dignity of his station would allow. Somehow, it didn't feel quite fast enough. Author's Note The Strange Affair of the Sundered Man is the third story I wrote with the character of Ulrich Popoka, and it's a bit nastier than the other two, being less a mystery and more a straight-up horror story in a lot of ways. Besides playing with some Lovecraftian themes, I was trying for an Agatha Christie sort of feel for the story, what with the big reveal of various and sundry facts known only to the detective at the climax. To that end, this story was originally going to take place at a country house in Blackpool, but I got bored with that early on and nixed it. Besides, stage magicians are so much cooler than stuffy rich folks, aren't they? Yes, you are correct, sir. That is funny stuff. Hey, thank you for uh, listening. And uh, no, I don't think we have a cast list this week. But uh, Rich Girardi edited it, did it. Ooh, I made up a word too. And produced it. Right. He, he narrated it. Yes. And uh, I wouldn't be surprised if a couple of those voices were him as well. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. Uh, that beast, the sound of the creature. I make that sound if I have to get up before, say, 10 a.m. I hear you. So that could have been Rich as well. All right. Thank you, Rich, for editing for us, for producing for us, for... For putting it all together. Okay. Let's see. So what are we going to talk about, man? This was the third story we'd done on this. First one, Sans Contessa. Darn it. Yeah. Uh, Which is actually, when it comes down to it, a good thing, because uh, I don't know what happened to the Contessa. I haven't seen her in at least a year, so it would be hard for me to get a voice from her for this one. You're right, but I think we could get Julie or somebody to do it. True, but, you know, then it wouldn't be a true sequel. It would be like one of those sequels. It would be like Harry Potter 3, is that what you're saying? Right, where everybody came back except for Dumbledore because he died. Uh I like the Countess, but, uh, yeah, do you think Renee can do an English accent? Oh, I don't know that I've heard her do one before. She does all sorts of voice. Have you listened to her book, uh, Dreaming of Deliverance? She does all sorts of different There's old lady voices and man voices and all sorts of crazy voices on that. Good stuff. We just uh, asked her to do a story where she has to do a character from when she's a child to when she's a, a grown woman. And so I'm looking forward to hearing how she does the little kid voice to, you know, the teenager voice. To. Yeah, that'll be fun. But I'm sorry. What? Aside how, how did the we... point, <laughs> you were talking about how you really like the uh, Contessa Felucci's voice, who doesn't appear in this story. No, but Popoka appears, and Frogmore appears, and and you say this is the second time you've done. Frogmore? Yes, Frogmore was in the first Popoka story. He had just a very quick 
appearance where he he opens the door. No, I think he doesn't even open the door. I think it's a a, a clockwork man opens the door and tries to take Popoka's coat. Your coat, your coat, your coat. And Popoka freaks out because he doesn't want this soulless right. thing to touch him. I, I get that reaction a lot. And then Constable Frogmore comes in, kicks it, and pushes it down. Rapes it. And acts belligerent. And then Felucci appears and... Dismisses him? Yes. I, I had a lot of fun with your performance of Frogmore. I don't know if it was fun for you to do, but it was fun to listen. You seem to have the entertaining character again like you did with Peacemaker. I don't know. <laughs> with Popoka, he's arrogant and, you know, he's know it all -y and, and, and maybe that makes him not likable. But, you know, he's a fairly straight character. Mm -hmm. And so in the past, like I got to be the, the voice of the Russian and I got to be the voice of the Frenchman or whatever. You know, I, I'd get to be Popoka and the bad guy. So I would be able to have my cake and eat it, too. Uh -huh. In this one, it, it was the dry character that I was. Oh. Plus, I didn't get to do an accent. Oh, you could have been Stromboli or whatever it was, if only... Uh, Grimaldi, if, Grim. Girardi, I believe his name was. If only we just said, no, Rich, this is our story. We don't want your help. This is our land. But, you know, those, those days are behind us. They are. There have been stories that I've wanted to produce, and we've had to part with them. And sometimes the uh, end result is you know amazing it's it's it goes in a completely different way than it would have had i produced it had you produced it had we produced it and even better it, it actually gets finished which is a completely different way than it would have gone <laughs> if we produced it well there's that for a little while there this year we were a weekly show and it's just not possible when the episodes are this long Mm -hmm. And I think if we asked people out there, would you rather we be more often but shorter or less often but longer, people would say more often and longer. <laughs> and so, you know, it's a, luckily we have people that are willing to produce episodes for us and they have different ideas and stresses and, and ways to go. And, and one thing that Rich did on this is filled it to the brim with sound effects and... Uh, if I had edited it, you would have heard the gunshot and uh, the, and that would have been it. So, you know, everybody has, oh, I, may, I wouldn't even have made up a velocipede sound effect. And, <laughs> I had fun with the velocipede sound effect back when I did uh, the Poka story the last time around. I think that one was called the strange affair of the, the skull at the window. Yes. Yeah, and I had fun imagining the countess bathing Ooh, bye. <laughs> uh, you, sir, are a douchebag. That's right. I like these stories. The What did we determine the genre was called? I believe it's uh, called steampunk. <laughs> <coughs> okay. Yeah, having no experience with steampunk, I'm fine with it. You know, I just came back from Comic-Con. Mm -hmm. And there are people that would dress as steampunk characters. Now you you have to have seen them. I saw that. a few of them when uh, when we went too. I didn't know steampunk very well back in those days either, and so it was. Uh, you just thought they were San Diegans. That's just the way people dressed in San Diego. I didn't have any idea. They can come up with some pretty cool costumes. I've seen lots of stuff on. I don't know. I think I want to say it was on Boing Boing dot com or one of those kind of places where they'll have a link to some kind of a thing that you can get and it's like a steampunk watch or a steampunk something and it'll be this this gigantic contraption it's all brass tubes and things going all over just to have a watch neat well i see i've seen lots of interesting things on bangbang.com but you know <laughs> teach their own oh you'll pay for that one so i think this story takes place earlier than the other ones. I mean, it's hard to say, but he makes reference to the Whitechapel murders, which is presumably a story <laughs> that has yet to be told. Or if he said this was the third one he wrote. Mm -hmm. So it may be that, you know, one of those earlier stories that we've not yet done. Oh, was there not another website that did? Are, are there only the four? There's the four. And yes, the fourth one with just Felucci and it was done by uh, Cosmas Infinities podcast. Did you just make up a bunch of words? 
Super Robot Monkey Team. <laughs> That's right. You just got bossed. Cosmas Infinities podcast. If you want to go and check that one out, you can listen to it there. Is that still going? The cosplay pirate. <laughs> Cosmas Infinities. Apparently, it's on a temporary hiatus. It went on hiatus in January 27th, and so far they're still on hiatus. So I don't know. It could be one of those pod fade type things, or maybe they'll come back. You never know. There has been other shows. I think Pseudopod went on hiatus for a couple months, and then they managed to come back, and Escape Pod did a similar trick. Have we ever gone on hiatus? Uh, I think pretty much in between every episode, we're on what could be called a temporary hiatus. Zing! Because, uh, you know, it's about three times what we say it's going to take for the next episode to come out. So people are like, oh, I think Dune Steve is dead. I think they probably just do that every time. But is Dune Steve dead? Oh, nope. Darn. <laughs> a new episode. Well, that's weird because... Since we've been getting guest producers, we've done a lot better, haven't we, for being yeah, a regular show? I would think so. If you recall, before this whole producing thing happened, there were a couple of months where we would have one episode the whole month. Yeah, I think that happened once or twice. And now there's no break longer than two weeks or two and a half, right? And that's due to some unforeseen thing like vacation or... Right. Trying to think of a, another option. <laughs> vacation or or like a tragedy like death in the family or you know a natural disaster a new transformers movie right anyhow thank you rich for producing that thank you joshua is it joshua or can i call him josh after you three episodes just call him josh. i'm going to thank you for sending us the the story uh if cause mass publications did i get it right productions damn if cause mass Productions. <laughs> if that Cosmas website has gone down, or the podcast has gone down, then maybe we could be the exclusive distributor for Strange Affairs stories. There can, there can be, be only, only one. one. <laughs> Who knows? Because uh, it seems like a long time ago he said that there were several stories, or maybe I'm dreaming. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if he's written more since. Well, that's right, because people that aren't us continually write. Mm -hmm. They continually expand their libraries. Right. Huh. Speaking of podcasts that aren't our own, although it really has nothing to do with podcasts that aren't our own. Okay. Let us, let's speak of a podcast that is our own. Okay. The Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. Yeah, that is our own <laughs> podcast. You're right. Parsec nominated Dune Steve oh. Audio Fiction Magazine. Yeah, yeah, we got a Parsec nomination. Oh, you mean the new Parsec. You mean multiple year Parsec nominated <laughs> Dune Steve. <laughs> multiple year, multiple Parsec That's right. Yeah, that's kind of exciting, huh? I did a voice on another guy's podcast that does like an audio drama, a real audio drama, oh. if you will. Look at that in the distance. It's shimmering. It's large. It's gray and seems to be made up of several parts with moving legs and eyes. What is that underneath, Jim? Could it be wheels? I can't quite tell. That's what a real audio drama is. I did a voice on that. And I guess the Parsec nominations came out and his podcast was not nominated. So he sent all of us that had worked on his show an email and he's like, oh, shoot, we didn't get a nomination this year. And, you know, and this is a list of the ones that did. And that's how I found out that the Dune Steve <laughs> was nominated, not just once, but three times. Uh, we got nominated for Best Short Story Audio Drama. Wait. I think they call it Best Audio Drama Short Form. Okay. Which is the category. I don't know if we mentioned that before, but, you know, they have the division between a story reading and an audio drama is whether you have two or less people reading or three or more. And since most of our stories tend to have three or more voices, because just me and Rish doing it is two voices. Last year, we were nominated as Best Story because we submitted our one episode of the year <laughs> in which it was just the two of us. 
And then uh, this year, yeah, we, we didn't have one that we could even submit for that category. There was no episode for the whole year which had two people or less reading. So we submitted stuff for uh, the audio drama category. And uh, we managed to get nominated for two of those stories. It was uh, A Place So Foreign by Cory Doctorow is one of the stories that was nominated one of my favorite episodes, or two episodes, I guess, because we had to split that one up. It was so long. And then uh, the other one was This Must Be the Place by Elliot Bangs. It's, it's exciting. We also got uh, our third nomination was for the best magazine category. I think we're facing some pretty stiff competition in that one, though. I think we You mean Clown Pod? No, as a matter of fact, we're facing the Drabblecast, Ooh. which won it last year. Yeah, that is so tough. They've got to be the hands-on favorite. And on top of that, we're facing Escape Pod. Oh, wow, the granddaddy of them all. Yes, the granddaddy of them all, the Rose Bowl. That's what they call the Rose Bowl. Is that right? Yes, that's where that phrase, the granddaddy of them all, comes from. Well, then you learn something new every day. Or if you're me, just every Monday. <laughs> They've done a bunch of stuff on that show. I mean, they've gone pro, and uh, they've got their soundproof episode, their things where oh, you yeah. can read the stories. They have uh, tons of like, reviews and, and stuff muddling up their website now. <laughs> yeah, uh, they've got reviews and all that kind of stuff that they've added in. So Now, there's two more that uh, were nominated against us we as well. It? I don't know those podcasts yet. I've, I've not listened to them, but I'll have to check them out and see yeah, how much listen. better than us they are. Well, you never know. I'd like to listen to the other stories that are nominated in our same category. It'd be interesting to see what the competition is. Maybe that's a bucket of worms. Is it a bucket? A can of worms. Yeah, I think you open a can of worms. It's a barrel of monkeys. Because of the recession, it's just a sardine tin of worms now. Uh, But hey, look, if you were one of the people that nominated us for this Parsec Award or helped us get there or one of the people that vote, thank you. Yeah. It's really cool to be Parsec nominated again. And that just means that it will be all the sadder when we don't get nominated. <laughs> but Rich knows because he you know, produced this episode. And what was the other one? Tupac Shakur and the End of the World. So then he knows the kind of work that goes into making this show. And so... You know, to be acknowledged, to get nominated, to be placed aside somebody like Drabblecast, that's an honor. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, we got to say congrats to Brian Lincoln, who was the one who actually produced This Must Be the Place. That's so right. That's uh, right. And he got a nomination for Full Cast yeah, podcast right. as well. Yeah, that's right. And I think he also works on the HG World oh, podcast. Yeah. And that one was nominated as well. Okay, that's just getting greedy. There can be only one. <laughs> uh, so thank you. I, I just wanted to get that out of the way. Uh, was there anything else we needed to talk about? Um, just uh, where we've been. Well, we've been a very small podcast. Just you and me and a couple of really, really bad actors from work doing parts. All the way to getting people that, that are normally paid for their acting to voice characters. That was actually supposed to be a segue into the Comic-Con stuff. Oh, so that brings us to the end of one more Parsec nominated in Steve episode. <laughs> I, I'm sorry, it just it feels good to say that. I hope that doesn't make me... Well, it probably does, doesn't it? I don't even have to finish the sentence. Yeah, it does. And now it's time to talk about something completely different. So, hey, you and I are back together in the... I almost called it a studio. <laughs> next to your couch for the first time in a couple weeks. Yeah, some uh, interesting things uh, transpired. Well, interesting for you at least, uh, not so much for me. But Well, okay, uh, in July you and I always go on our separate vacations. I mean, it's just, of course they'd be separate. Well, no. Not necessarily. There was, because... yeah, there was times that we both went to Comic-Con. It's just been a while since that's been able to happen again. Because your family conspires against me. They do. They despise you and find ways to uh, hurt you where it counts. That's why my children always line up and meet you at the door with a kick to the crotch. Yeah, the the youngest one is just tall enough now to injure me. (laughs) She's wanting karate lessons too. Just you wait. (laughs) Oh please, you don't. She's destructive enough without the ability to maim. 
So uh, why don't you tell me a little bit about where you went and what you did? Well, we did our uh, annual trek to Canada because uh, my wife is a Canadian. She is les habitants. Okay, that's enough. Let's talk about my vacation. <laughs> I think that's what they call the uh, Montreal Canadians. That's their uh, nickname, but they just call them the Habs because that's short and that's English, and so people can say that. Um, yeah, she's Canadian, so we always, uh, you know, she wants to see her family still on occasion, and I try to put my foot down and say, no, we will never see your family again, but that doesn't seem to work for uh, our marriage and harmony and peace in the household, so... Here and there, I have to uh, kowtow to her will. Well, how <laughs> difficult is it to go to Canada? Are the borders open? Do each of your children have to have passports? Uh, it's not too bad. Um, as long as you're driving, you don't have to have passports for the children. You can just use their birth certificates. If you're flying, you do have to have a passport. And we're close enough that we can drive. It's a long drive, but we can get there. And uh, we have these... <laughs> There was something that they came out with that's like a passport card. And the last time that we went to Canada, it was really close to the time that we were supposed to leave. And the passport card was the only thing that we would have had in time to go. So we had to get those. And those are the same kind of thing. You can't fly with it. You can only drive across the border. And I think you can only go to the Bahamas or something like that. You know, if you're going on a boat, I'm not sure. But I know you can use them in Mexico and Canada. So you've never flown to Canada? We have not. Okay. I think my wife may have, but I haven't. Anyways, so we drove up there. It's like a day's trip for us to get there. But luckily for us, her dad retired, and uh, they decided to move south. They were away, you know, six hours away from the border. So our trip used to be an 18-hour trip. Now it's come down to just a 12-hour trip. So that's handy. We drove up there and got there in the evening and... Uh, we did some camping. Uh, there's a uh, a national park that's kind of nearby where they live, and we went out and stayed a few days there. And that was kind of fun. It was pretty. It's a really nice place. Most importantly, you got a lot of writing done. <laughs> and that's good because, you know, we talked about how far behind you were. But, you know, you were looking forward to this vacation. I'm sure you got a new notebook and filled it. To the brim. Sometimes I envy that. No, I filled it with frustration. I would got no writing done this year. Because her parents moved south, their house is brand new. And uh, they wanted sprinklers put in and stuff like that. And they said, hey, look, free labor. Turns out her, her father broke his ankle. So he was uh, kind of incapacitated. And so he's not able to go out and do all these things uh, if he's going anywhere, he's in a wheelchair or he's on crutches or whatever, he can't do anything. And so when we were up there, yeah, we were doing yard work and stuff like that. I never had a chance to get any writing done. I felt a little irritated, I'll have to admit. I was sad because, yeah, the last time I went, it was weeks of just peace and quiet. It was like a, ret a writer's retreat. This time around, not so much. So I was a little bummed about that. That's too bad. I, I don't know how many of our listeners like it when we talk about writing and how things are going and that, but I like it. And I like it when somebody says, hey, you know, in an episode, you talked about some story that you were going to write. Did you ever finish that? And I'm like, oh, I got to do that just so <laughs> that I can answer yes or, or, or I could lie. It never occurred to me to just lie. Oh. Yeah, yes, yes. Long done. Sold to Weird Tales. <laughs> Sold to Abyss and Apex. There you go. That's the one I'm obsessed with. I forget. <laughs> well, you know, it's a, a shame. Because you accomplished a lot of writing in that last Canadian trip. Yeah, that was good. And the whole scheduling thing, you know, the, the family reunions, people always schedule them in July for some reason. Yeah, and, that uh, does happen pretty frequently. July is just the month for the family vacation, it seems. Also the month for uh, Comic-Con. Well, no, that's what I was talking about. Comic-Con happens at the end of every July, and I really, really look forward to it. And I like it more when I'm with somebody, you know, you and I have gone down together a couple of times, but it just never works out either money wise or, I mean, it's usually not even money wise because yeah. we've managed to get in really cheap in the past. It's just somebody always schedules a family thing for that same time. Yeah, I've actually had to leave family things to go the one time that we did go together. <laughs> I think her parents were in town to visit us that year. And I said, man, sorry, I'm going. 
I'm sure they added that to reasons why I'm their worst son-in-law, but, uh, you know. I, I, well, I remember <laughs> after we talked about it last year, you said, I'm writing it off at work. I'm going next year. Mm. And that didn't work out, but... Not everybody can go, and, and it looked really likely I wasn't going to be able to go this year. Yeah. And I was bummed about that. I, I guess I hadn't realized how much I looked forward to it until I was told I can't go. And as the days got closer and closer, I, I just was like, no, you know what? This is the thing I look forward to most every summer. I had to make sa certain sacrifices to go this year that I never have before. And I mean, sacrifices the, to dark, dark deities. Indeed. In the past, if you recall, we have made enough money, like selling the free posters or the, you know, the promo buttons and all that stuff, usually to either pay for our gas or pay for our lodging. I think there was one time that it paid for the whole trip. Mm -hmm. uh, it was probably that one time that we got the Twilight posters right. because people paid like $75 a piece for those and they were free. Uh -huh. I think you had two and I had one or I had two and you had one or whatever. And right there, that paid for gas for the whole trip, mm -hmm. which was really neat. Uh, and I knew that this year that wasn't going to happen. Right. But... I went anyway because I, I know myself well enough to say I'd regret it if I didn't. Mm -hmm. And you, it, you know, spend your money on something, I guess, right? Save the money. Come on, who wants to do that? Well, certainly not you, Mister <laughs> Sperminator. Um, uh, because I enjoyed Comic Con so much last year, I was willing to make the sacrifice, and I went, and and it was difficult, but. But I went, and I'm glad I went. I, I had a good time. I don't think I had quite as good a time as I did last year, but I didn't have nearly as negative experience as I did the time before. Mm -hmm. You know, there's still a lot of crowds, and there's still a lot of inept scheduling or inept uh, organization. Mm -hmm. um, for example, on Sunday, there was this panel for Doctor Who, mm -hmm. and I really wanted to go to it, and so did, a th well, well more than 1,000, because six. 6,500 people fit in Hall H. So so did thousands of other people. Uh -huh. And I got in line. The panel was at 1230, and I got in line at 11-something to go to it. And the line just – it moved a little bit at a time. And I started to wonder if maybe I wouldn't make it in because when I got to the back of the line, you remember the Hall H line. It's the one that's outdoors. Right. And, you know, it snaked around and around and around and around. And I was doing the math in my head and I was like, well, unless 2,000 people get up and leave whatever panel is going right now, I don't think I'm going to make it in. But because the line was constantly moving, I thought, well, I'll, I'll at least give it until 1230. Mm -hmm. And noon came around and, uh, you know, we were still in the line. And at one point the line stopped moving. So everybody sat down, not everybody, but I sat down and, you know, then 1230 came along and I was like, well, yeah, maybe I should just go get lunch. There's no chance I'm going to be able to see this panel. But I remembered from the last time I'd been in Hall H that everything gets delayed. And the later in the day it is, the more late the panels start. You know, mm -hmm. a five o'clock panel doesn't start until quarter to six. And so I said, okay, well, I'll give it until one, you know what I mean? Or 12.45. And, and finally the line started to move again. And uh, I found out that the reason the line had moved was because not only had the Doctor Who panel started, the Doctor Who panel had ended and nobody had bothered to tell all of these people dressed up as Daleks, dressed up as Weeping <laughs> Angels, dressed up as Amy Pond in the friggin' line that were there to see Doctor Who, that, that the Doctor Who panel had started and was over until, and it was like, you know, like 1.30 or whatever. Somebody said, this line is now for the Cleveland show. And it's like, why? How? All of these security people have walkie talkies and all of them could have let people know. You know, if you're there with a Doctor Who t-shirt on, chances are you're there to see the Doctor Who panel. Mm -hmm. It sucked that they didn't bother to tell us that. And I was so angry about that that I just left. There were still hours left in the convention. I, you know, I could have gone in there and run the gauntlet again and maybe got a couple more free things. But I just was like, bull crap. I'm going to get food and, and I'm not coming back. And, and so there was that. That was, you know, the sour note to end the convention on and there's always stuff like that stuff right. where common sense would dictate that you do something and they don't do that or they do the opposite but there was non-sour notes you've only told a sour note so far right you had sweet things which is the opposite of sour right yeah, i don't know <laughs> sweet and sour pork Ooh, but those aren't those really opposites are, are they? two they're... great tastes that taste great together aren't they gi joe <laughs> the, yeah yeah for the most part the comic-con experience was a good one this year, and I don't know why I focused on that last bitter note. Bitter, see? Oh, wow, see? Maybe that's the opposite. 
you know, for the people that haven't been, it's geek mecca. And people come not just from across the United States, but there were people in the line on Friday with me that had flown from Australia. Wow. And they were just talking about how it was a 12-hour flight from Melbourne. And when they got here, because of the 14-hour difference, it was two hours earlier than when they'd left. But when they fly back, it's going to be a whole nother day because they, they will have lost that 12 hours. Interesting. And these guys have sacrificed way more than I had to be there. I, well, I, maybe not. Maybe it's just monetary we're talking about. But they cared that much about... I think they have even darker deities in uh, Australia, so they probably did have to sacrifice more. <laughs> the dark god Crocodile Dundee. There you go. The darkest of them all. They pray to the spirit of Steve Irwin. The dark god Bindi Irwin. <laughs> Hey, that ain't funny, man. That guy was a natural hero. That's right. Too soon. Yeah, too soon. I don't know. I, every year I have stuff that I talk to you about and stuff that I, I want to talk about. And I called you like three or four times yeah. from Comic-Con, mostly when I would get out of a panel because that's something we said in a really recent episode about a vacation. You want there to be somebody next to you so you can say, hey, that's pretty. Do you see that? Right. You know what I mean? There would be things that I thought were cool or things that I thought weren't. And I wanted to tell somebody. So I was on the phone a lot. Well, that's a good thing about cell phones, I guess. The one good thing. Me and thing. you kind of rail against cell phones fairly often, but uh, it's almost like having somebody there with you. If you can just call them up from there and talk with them, tell them what uh, interesting thing you've learned. What interesting things did you learn, by the way? I don't know. The, the, the panel that I was most looking forward to was the Tin Tin panel. Really? And that seems odd, but it's because Steven Spielberg was there promoting oh. Tintin, and he'd never been at a Comic-Con before. Oh, really? Oh. I, so I was excited about that, and he came out, and he uh, was talking a little bit about when they first developed the project, they weren't sure if they would do live action with like CG elements to it, or mm -hmm. if they'd do fully animated like they ended up doing, or I, I don't know, would you call motion capture fully animated or would you call it the step in between live action and fully animated <laughs> it's video game animated yeah uh, it is something in between because I, I think and i think i've mentioned this on the show before but they have that qualifier in the best animated feature oscar that it needs to be like almost a hundred percent not a hundred percent but like at least like 95 or 90 i don't know what the percentage is must be actual animated not motion capture or any other shortcuts used oh really so a movie like the christmas carol the jim carrey one, right wouldn't have wouldn't qualify right that's interesting it's a fairly new rule i think once uh, that motion capture thing became more common i think they uh, decided to make that the rule um, good thing green lantern qualifies yeah it still does um anyhow so they showed this test footage that they had shot years ago and it had Peter Jackson in it, and he was just talking, and then a CG dog did antics around his feet and, and, and stuff to see if they could make this dog look, A, exactly like the dog in the old Tin Tin books, mm -hmm. and B, look real. You know what I mean? Like it was really there. Okay. You know what I'm saying? Right. Were the drawings from the old Tin Tin really realistic? No. Oh. So, but this is when they were talking about mixing live action and animation. Uh -huh. But, you know, in a Roger Rabbit sort of way, they wanted to make it look like it was interacting with Peter Jackson. Uh -huh. is this, uh, am I not explaining this no, correctly? That makes so, sense. But was this a long time ago? Because they've done lots of stuff like that, right? I, it was four or five years ago, I think. But it doesn't matter. Okay. They, well, they were just doing a test back when they wanted to do it live action uh -huh. to see if they could have a CG dog in a live action movie okay. and have it be believable. Have it not suck like Rise of the Planet of the Apes stuff does? It's funny. I, I, I hate to go off on a tangent, but I always do. Jeff and I kind of had an argument about that last night. Yeah? And finally he was just like, it doesn't bother me. It doesn't look fake to me. You, you're the one with the problem, not me. And, I, and he says, I want to see that. And nothing you can say is going to make me not want to see Interesting. that. Interesting. And I was just like, well, yeah, but the scene where it reaches out through the bars... That could have just been a guy with a furry arm or whatever on. But instead, it's a lousy fake CG. Effect. That could have just been Robin Williams' hand. <laughs> that's funny stuff. Yeah, and I just uh, that's something we'll talk about in the future. Maybe we'll go see that movie. I don't know. I, I don't You'll want go to. see it. But, uh, all right. <laughs> well, I'm not going to let this 15th kid of yours... <laughs> 
<laughs> get in the way of going watching movies and all the things that we usually do. What the hell am I? Oh, okay. So they showed this this test footage, and then when it was over, Peter Jackson came out, and he was on the panel. So it was a moderator and Steven Spielberg and Peter Jackson, and these Is two. It fat Peter Jackson or skinny Peter Jackson? Fat ish Peter Jackson. Oh. Yeah. He, I, I don't like skinny Peter Jackson. <laughs> I was really happy that he's put on the weight again because that's the guy we love. Can you imagine like a skinny Santa Claus or something? If you like, yeah, it would be him. like a skinny Drew Carey. That would be freakish. Well, any Drew Carey, I think, is <laughs> sad that you remember him. Did he make that big of an impact in your life? No, but he's skinny now. Have you seen that dude? No. He's skinny as frick, man. He's like... No, Daddy. Make the bad man go away. No. <laughs> yeah, he, he makes that Olsen twins girl looks like, you know, she's been freaking hitting the buffets. He is really skinny. Well, I've heard they're doing a live action He-Man movie and they will need a Skeletor. There you go. No, well, he's not that skinny, but it's it's pretty amazing considering how fat Drew Carey once was. I guess he had a heart attack and that scared him straight. Okay. He stopped having steak and eggs for breakfast every day and actually ate a vegetable. So now he's uh, Bob Barker. All right. I don't know how we got on this. I, I, I am comforted by the heavy Peter Jackson. I hear you. So anyhow, they came out and they talked. And they, and because Spielberg had never been to Comic-Con before, they had presented him with this award, uh, the one that they gave Miyazaki last year. And, and he's just like, oh, this honorable geeks in the room. It's like <laughs> all of you in Japan, we know how to treat animation directors. I wipe my Japanese ass with this award. <laughs> and I was just like, wow. He um, bitch slapped John Lasseter. Do you remember that? Yeah, I think you were, remember you were talking about that. Anyhow, they gave the same award to Spielberg, and they had this reel uh, that was like seven or eight minutes of his movies, a uh, montage, you know, with, with music in the background and stuff. And it was just like all the chase scenes, all the kisses, all the terror scenes, you know, all like the panoramic vistas and stuff. And oh my gosh, it was so cool. Even though... They had footage from Hook and War of the Worlds in there. It was just awesome. For one second, you had to go, yeah, and cringe as they went, Rufy, oh. God, I hate Hook. <laughs> I showed that to my kids not too long ago. See, you're not a good parent. You're, that, you're, you're, you're basically a Dougal parent now. But, oh, that was so cool. I, I don't know. Spielberg's work is really... I'm I'm just a huge fan, and then they they showed the footage from Tintin, and if you're American like me, you have no idea what Tintin is. It holds no special place in your heart. Right. I I when you mentioned it to me, I assumed it must be something about, especially when you mentioned a dog too. I assumed it's going to be Rin Tin Tin, and I don't even know how. I I mean that's a silent era serial thing or something, right? Rin Tin Tin. I think Rin Tin Tin had a TV series in the fifties. Oh yeah. Okay. So, so it was pretty recently. Yeah, really recent. From when I was, uh, yeah, yeah, from when my dad was a child. Anyhow, they showed this stuff. And, and should I explain very, very briefly what, what Tintin is? Oh, I'm sorry. We haven't time. Okay. Why don't we just direct people to the Wikipedia page about Tintin? Okay. I'll put a link. But anyhow, these stories were written in like the 40s or somewhere around that year. And the movie is set then. And... It's got this really Indiana Jones feel, like the way that all the cars are and the way that all the clothes are and the way that the, do you call it cinematography, the art direction, whatever you call that in animation, just the look of the film feels like we're watching an animated Indiana mm-hmm. Jones and the, the capper is it had new John Williams music Ooh. in it. And that felt like, oh my gosh, Indiana Jones. And I had no connection to any of this stuff, but I want to see it now. Now that mm-hmm. because of the footage that they showed, it feels like classic Spielberg magic. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I hope that, that the movie is good. And uh, Peter Jackson is going to direct the next one. He produced this one and he was going to direct the second one. And Spielberg will produce the second one. You know, their, their roles will reverse for ah, the sequel. Okay. Peter Jackson said, you know, I hope everybody goes to see this. And tells all their friends to go see it, too, because I want to be able to make mine. And there were 23 books, apparently, and they would like to make a bunch of these. Mm -hmm. Now, there were children's books, right? Yeah. Are they little, like, Dr. Seuss-sized books, or are they, like... Judy Moody and the not bummer summer size books, sir. You take that back, sir. This is a family program. 
<laughs> what, do you know what size? I mean, how many? I don't know. Let's just pretend that we know and say that it's Hardy Boys sized, you know? Okay. That each one has a, a mystery and an adventure. When you told me about this in the first place, I was imagining some kind of Curious George sized book or something like that. And I was just, now that you talk about 23 books and they want to make several of them, I was thinking, are they putting a bunch of them together? I don't want it to be some kind of how the Grinch stole Christmas or Cat in the Hat kind of a thing. Yes, but those were awful movies. Yeah, I know. That's why I don't want them to be like that. Has there ever been a good Dr. Seuss adaptation? I'm sorry, a feature length Dr. Seuss adaptation? I don't know. I wouldn't say that I'm a big fan of any of them, so I can't say yay to that question. Well, let's just say no and we'll move on. No, we have to say nay. Okay. That's the opposite of yay. What is that? You know, last year, there was the Cowboys and Aliens panel, where it was a movie that I hadn't really heard of, I didn't know was coming, and I was so impressed that I'm like, oh, I can't wait for that movie. And I I would say that Tintin was this year's. Cowboys and Aliens? Yeah. It's Um, funny, because Cowboys and Aliens opens... Tomorrow? In 50 minutes. (laughs) And we have tickets. That's why we haven't time to give you the Tintin explanation, and you're going to have to go to Wikipedia. So that's something that we talked about on the cell phone is there were many little stories and things that I saw and things that I experienced that I wanted to talk about when we did our Comic Con episode. But I knew that when the cameras rolled, sorry, when the microphone rolled, what does what rolls? Nothing. Okay. It's all digital. That I would forget and I would be like, oh, I meant to tell that story. And, that. and yeah, now that I'm talking, my mind has gone completely blank. Okay, well, beyond Tintin, I think we've spent enough time on Tintin. We know now that it's Spielberg-esque, has John Williams music, and you should probably check it out. Although, I guess we'll really know as it gets closer and we start seeing... Yeah, it's not until Christmas time, so... Start seeing trailers and things like that and gives us a better idea of, do we really want to see this? Or do we just want to see it because Spielberg directed it? Let's move on to uh, something else that you uh, went to. What about... You you talked about Amazing Spider-Man. I... Did. And okay, so th- this will be the second story that I'll tell. And this was something that I did want to talk to you about. Okay. And this could be a That Gets My Goat episode all on its own. But something that I discussed last year was with Hall H, the great big auditorium where they have the big panels. Mm-hmm. It's often really difficult to get in to see a panel because the demand way outweighs the supply. Right. And so last year, I got up really early in the morning so that I could guarantee that I'd be able to see what I wanted to see. Because the year before, I got to see nothing. And yet I still spent hours and hours in the line. And so this year, I decided to do that as well. But the day I chose started out with Tintin as the very first panel of the day. And the last panel of the day was Amazing Spider-Man. And those were the two things that I wanted to see. And in between were hours and hours of things that I wasn't all that interested in. And so I had to make the decision of... Do you dare leave? Yeah. Do I leave and roll the dice and maybe not get back in to see Spider-Man? Or do I just stay put and write it out and see a bunch of panels for movies that I'm not interested in? Like when we watched Escape to Witch Mountain uh, panel because of that same reason? Is that why we did that? Or did we just see, hey, Escape from Witch Mountain is up next. Do you want to go see that? I think we went, we were trying to get into like the Hulk versus Wolverine or something like that. Oh, I don't think so. I think we just went in there to sleep for Hulk and Wolverine. <laughs> That's what we wound up doing, yeah. Been too long. It been has been way a too long. That's not something I've heard in a long time. How long? A long time. Sorry, folks. So I chose to stay there and spend the whole day in that seat. And panel after panel happened for movies that I didn't, that didn't appeal to me. Mm -hmm. But there were a heck of a lot of people there in the audience that it did appeal to, that were really excited about whatever movie that they were there to promote. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, it just started making me feel really, really old. Like I was no longer relevant. Like I long, no longer had my finger on the pulse of what's hip and what's cool and what everybody likes. And that it just made me feel like, you know, all these movies are not, are not for me because I'm old. And that was sad. Um, for example, one of the panels was for 
Ghost Rider Spirit of Vengeance, Ooh. which is the sequel to the Ghost Rider from just a few years ago. Nicolas Cage came back. How to get burned? How to get burned? How to get burned? How to get burned? He was the only th- element that came back for the sequel. And it's got these two young, crazy, extreme directors that are willing to do anything to get some amazing shot. Like they would hook themselves up in harnesses and have themselves pulled up into the air to follow like a motorcycle crash. Or one of them was backwards on rollerblades holding on or being held on to the back of a motorcycle holding his camera out. And then the guy holding him let go. And so backwards blind, he was filming something a chase scene or whatever, just right there in the middle of the action. They showed all these things. These guys put, seriously, they put themselves in jeopardy to get some crazy shot, stuff that no director would ever do. I mean, maybe they're used to directing X Games performances and things like that. Mm-hmm. Or, or you know, like extreme documentaries about snowboarding and right. kickboxing and fisting, and, you know, just crazy things. And so these two guys came out after uh, and did i say that they showed all this stuff in a, a little presentation reel of what okay. these guys did these guys came out and and everybody on the panel talked about how just how crazy it was nicholas cage said that you know watching what these directors were willing to do it made him want to up his game and, and not have like stunt guys step in for him he's like you know if, if the director is willing to risk breaking his neck i want to be on the motorcycle when it crashes or i want to do this and that, and I thought, wow, this is really cool. You know, well, we don't usually see directors like this anymore. You know, the, the dedication where you go, where you go see a movie just because of who directed it, right? And like Spielberg, right? Well, Spielberg's been around a while, so mm-hmm. that's what I'm saying by you anymore. Right. Anymore. I'm just, you know, that's a callback to our oh, previous okay. story. I, I, it's been so long since I wrote anything that I is that a bear? You want to see the bear? No. So I was getting excited, just like everybody else in the room. And then they showed footage from Ghost Rider, Spirit of Vengeance. And sir, there's a reason why no directors do things like this or hook themselves up to a harness to get (laughs) yanked up into the air to grab an explosion. It was like somebody taking a camcorder on a roller coaster and their hand is just wobbling or whatever. You couldn't tell that it was really Nicolas Cage on that motorcycle. It could have been a mannequin and you never would have known because <laughs> the cinematography was all over the place. There's something to be said for a steady cam or a crane shot. Tradition has proven itself. If you want to be able to see what the action is, how about a wide shot hold on the action? Oh, it bummed the crap out of me <laughs> when they were just all talking about wave of the future. These are the directors that, you know, they're going to make their mark on Hollywood and everybody's going to be talking about things. And then the footage was just crap. I think Rish is right. And then just a little while later, there was a panel for a remake of Fright Night. Uh And the fact that they're remaking movies from not that long ago has made me feel old for a long time. But then we saw all this footage because the movie is done Mm -hmm. that was in 3D. And there was a car chase at night. And each of the cars had four headlights because of the shoddy 3D. 3D. And I wanted to stand up like Annie Wilkes again and says, has everybody gone insane? This is terrible. (laughs) There shouldn't be four headlights. That proves that this 3D is not working. Cats and dogs living together. Mass hysteria. Oh, gosh. It just made me so bummed out. You know, the people are just like, wow, this is really cool. We're willing to pay $3 extra to be able to see extra headlights. (laughs) Maybe it was one of those trucks. That are always seem to be right behind me and blinding me in my rearview mirror at night that has four headlights. Nice one. Then there was a panel for Total Recall, a remake of a movie from 1990. Dude, that's not long ago, is no, it? No, it's not. If somebody tells me it is long ago, then I am old. You know what I mean? Cause it, I mean, you could say it's long ago because that's 21 years ago, but that's not long ago for a remake of a film. Usually they wait a little bit longer in between remakes. I don't know. It seems uh, awful early. Uh, yeah, I won't even talk about that. I mean, they showed some footage from it. It's directed by Len Wiseman, who did the Underworld movies. He did the fourth Die Hard. And the audience was really, really eating it up. And, and to me, it was, uh, I mean, it didn't look like crap. I think he's a competent director. Mm-hmm. But it doesn't 
it's not something that I need to see. And it's right. not because I was a huge fan of the original. It just, I, I guess the whole remake aesthetic, it screams cheap to me. It screams easy cash in, cash grab. Right. And there was a panel for this movie called 30 Minutes or Less, directed by the guy that did Zombieland, that it looks like a really funny comedy. It, it does. I'm willing to not sound old and say, hey, this looks funny. But there was one member of the cast that was on the panel, and he kept making these jokes. Somebody would ask a question to somebody else, and he would jump in there and make a joke. And the audience loved it, man. They, they were laughing <laughs> so hard. It was one of those where, where tears were rolling down people's cheeks. He was so funny. And I, again, Annie Wilkes moment. Dude. <laughs> I have everybody gone insane. This guy is so, so not funny. But, but you know, people, you know, it's the kind of thing where they're doubled over, their sides hurt. They're laughing so hard at the things that the guy said. And for example, he had made this joke about, uh, it's like, oh, is everybody having a good time at Comic-Con? And he's like, oh, how many of you guys were in that uh, Dark Knight uh, Rises panel this morning? And he's like, oh, wasn't that killer? They showed the first 20 minutes of Dark Knight Rises. Wasn't that great? And he's like, oh, and that teaser trailer for Inception 2. I can't believe they made that already. Oh, gosh, people were crying laughing. I mean, just the funniest, you know, I, I looked around and it's just like, I am so old and not with it because this is not funny. It's, you know, it's like when my younger siblings try and tell me how hilarious Dane Cook is, I know they're wrong, but I've never been in a room with 6,000 Dane Cook fans that are just gut splittingly, uproariously laughing. And so it just, oh, it bummed me out. And, and there was more to come. And to, to, to summarize, the last panel of the day was Amazing Spider-Man. Mm -hmm. And it's a reboot. They're starting again with Uncle Ben alive and him not having the powers and getting bit by the spider and Uncle Ben dying. And again, I am so oh. old. Yeah, they're remaking movies from <laughs> eight years ago now. Nine years ago, I guess, huh? Am I the only one on this? I, 2002 was 10 minutes ago. <laughs> yeah, I was really surprised because we went and saw Captain America the other day. Right after you got back on Monday, we went and saw it. And they had the a trailer at the start for Amazing Spider-Man. And you saw him get bit by the spider again. And I was thinking, well, why would you do that? Natasha. She, she said she'd be, be here. here. It just didn't make any sense. We've all seen that really recently. You don't need to rehash that whole bit again. Just start with them already Spider-Man and go from there, right? And I, that's what I thought they were doing. I thought it was going to be like a, this is a bad example, but a Batman Forever or, you know, a Man with a Golden Gun or something like that. Or Honor Majesty's Secret Service, we can say that. Where it just, it's a new actor, but it's just continuing the narrative. It's more adventures of this character mm -hmm. and and i knew that they were going back to high school but right. i didn't have a problem with that it's just like okay this is an earlier adventure in, in peter's life right why not but to go back to when he's just geeky peter parker again and show the whole origin again too soon my friend. yeah that seems really silly I, it's not something that you need you know it's like when batman begins came out you're like oh that's interesting because you hadn't ever seen a film version of Batman origin. Stop farting. That wasn't farting. It was the chair. Sure, it was the chair. I've heard that one a hundred times in this very room. That smell is the chair, too. <laughs> well, okay. They're saying that, that Dark Knight Rises is the last in the Dark Knight trilogy. Uh, what if they reboot Batman again and they decide to do the origin again? Yeah, that would... It's idiotic, man. be ridiculous, and I hope that they don't do that. I would assume that they throw a new director at it if Chris Nolan's done. But yes, to, to retread that ground so soon... Uh, I don't know. It's, it's, it's also... It's not like... It was a, an unsuccessful film, a movie that botched it or whatever. I'm trying right. to think of, of one where they've done that. Where they, I guess we could talk about Hulk. But even in Hulk, they cut all that yeah. stuff out and just threw it in the they credits. Didn't do the origin. They just kind of showed, oh, yeah, Hulk, he had an accident. Oh, and now he's hiding in Brazil. Go. I don't know how Hulk would have felt differently if they had done it in the traditional way and all that. I mean, it would have been 20 minutes longer, which would have been nice. But just to, to redo it... And at Comic-Con, they showed a bunch of scenes 
And one of the scenes was Peter has been suspended because he's gotten his powers and there's a bully that picks on him at high school and he turns the tables on the bully. He gets suspended for fighting and then his uncle comes to bail him out or whatever you call that in <laughs> high school. And his uncle just chews him out and that about being vindictive and seeking revenge on this bully and he gives him the speech. Uh-huh. Great power, great responsibility. <sighs> wow, again? And that wasn't even from the comics, that whole bully thing. That was made up for the Sam Raimi movie, and you're doing it again already? Now, granted, I got a year on everybody else. You know, everybody else will see it in 2012. And so maybe they'll have had a whole nother year of distance yeah, from by 2012. Then, by then, they'll have forgotten it completely. It felt so soon and so unnecessary. And honestly, I mean, I, I don't think those Raimi movies are perfect by any means. But can you really do the origin better than they did? And if so, wouldn't it take longer? You know what I mean? If, if you right. say, okay. Just to put more into it. We're going to do it one step better. Let's dedicate a whole movie to it or whatever. And, and you mm -hmm. could. Right. But I wish they hadn't. I yeah. I'm not one of those people that think origin stories are boring. I've had lots of people tell me that Superman 2 is better than Superman 1 because you get the whole boring origin in Superman 1. And I couldn't disagree more. Yeah, I don't agree with but, that. But if somebody did a Superman origin movie again... I would feel like, okay, Richard Donner did it so well and he took a whole hour and like 10 minutes to do it. And if you don't like that, Smallville did it in eight friggin' years. You're going to do better than that. Okay, let's just start with him being Superman or let's start with his first adventure as Superman. You know what I mean? Superman begins. And with Spider-Man, I wish they had just said, we'll spend th seven minutes setting up how he got his powers and all that in the credits or whatever, you know, previously on Spider-Man. <laughs> and then we'll have two hours to do, you know, a young adventure of, of Spider-Man. And you know what? I don't know. I'm not, I've been proved wrong before. Mm -hmm. It may be that this movie is awesome. True. But it made me feel old. And there were a couple of scenes they showed what the action sequences are going to be like. And they made us put our 3D glasses on. And yet there's a part in the trailer where you see a little bit of him jumping and climbing up the wall. And, that. Uh -huh. and we saw some of that in 3D. And it just, oh... It made you sick. It huh? really, it didn't make me sick, but it was just. I bet you my wife would just uh, vomit it all over. You know, when we got our first POV video game for our PlayStation 2, she just puked the whole night long after playing that. Some people just can't handle that kind of stuff. And putting it into 3D seems like it would be twice as bad. I think so. Hopefully, it will also be available in 2D. Because <laughs> even though it makes me feel old, I'll go see it. Right. And I will go see it opening night because I love Spider-Man. And I'm going to put a positive spin on this because, yes, it made me feel old. But hearing that new John Williams music in Tin Tin made me feel young. Seeing those Spielberg images, iconic images from my childhood all the way up to scenes from Munich and Private Ryan. And, geez, Private Ryan's not, not even new anymore. Made me feel young. And at the very beginning of the Amazing Spider-Man panel, the moderator came out. And he was about to introduce the cast and some geeky kid in the world's worst homemade Spider-Man costume ran up to the microphone and said, hey, can I ask a question? Can I say something? Can I? And he says, no, the questions will be in a few minutes. And he's like, no, no, I really got to say something. And he said, OK. And, and because he said, OK, I knew it was staged. Right. <laughs> because in all honesty, as badly organized as these things are, there's no way that microphone would be on, and the second somebody approached, security would be on him like me on Anne Hathaway. They would have tackled him, beat him down, even though he was only six. That's true. Yeah. Beat him to a bloody pulp. Yeah, I know a guy who punched like a three-year-old at Comic-Con. <laughs> and you know a guy that did too. Uh, so he says, okay, say what you got to say. And he says, oh, I'm so excited that there's a new Spider-Man movie. And, and I, oh, geez, it's really hard to breathe in this thing. And he took off the mask and it was Andrew Garfield who is playing Peter Parker in this. And then he downshifts to his real British accent. And he says, I, I, I brought a, a prepared statement. And he reads this statement about what Spider-Man meant to him as a child and growing up and what he feels like it means to every young person of who Peter Parker is and somebody who tries to do the right thing and makes mistakes, but they get up again when, when they've made those mistakes and the inspiration of finding 
what's special and magical and heroic within ourselves. And he's like, you know, so I am honored to be a part of this thing. And, and I just, I wanted to say that. And everybody applauded. And then he went up on the stage and the director came out and Emma Stone came out. And eventually Reese iFans came out, the guy who's playing Kurt Connors. And they all just like talked for a few minutes and they showed a lot of footage of the movie. And, you know, they're, they're excited and it's coming out next summer. And I'm sure it'll do very, very, very well. Yeah, Spider-Man tends to. But more importantly, you know, I, I hope... That is a very good movie. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, again, I'm old. I would rather a movie be good and not make a dime than be shit and make Transformers numbers. I hear you. People 50 years from now are still going to watch Shawshank Redemption, even though it didn't make a dime. People 100 years from now are still going to watch It's a Wonderful Life, even though it didn't make a dime. People... 10 years from now, hopefully, we'll no longer be watching Transformers. Yeah, that's probably true. Okay, we're out of time for this week. I think we can probably talk a little bit more about Comic-Con in the next episode. Okay. Because I think you've got a lot more to say. I may, I don't remember. I mean, that was me summing up there with that little speech. Right. right. That's a good uh, way to at least finish off this. Uh, but I think you had more to, I mean, you, you talked more to me on the phone about m many other things. So I think we've got more that we can say on it. And I think folks might be interested to hear. So we'll oh, no. continue in next week's show. But for now, we're going to go ahead and sign off. So thanks for listening, folks. Thank you for listening all the way to the end. Thank you for sending in your stories doing the voices, helping us produce, and uh, commenting at the bottom. Yeah. We have a forum now that people can go to. That's right. Let me see if I can remember the address. Uh, I was trying to come up with... Something dirty. Some dirty website awesome. that I send people to. Doonsteef.freeforums.org Yes. Wait, is it org or com? Org. Is it? And uh, you're welcome to go there, talk about the Parsec nominations, talk about, sorry, <laughs> <laughs> talk, about, <laughs> talk about That Gets My Goat, talk about The Sundered Man. If you've got questions or comments or things that you want to put on there, put them on there. And one of us will try and get a response to you. Uh, that's another way that uh, you can join the Dune Steve community and make us feel good. And you, you can also donate, but I'm not going to beg for donations this week. All right. Okay, well... Give us a donation if you feel like it. I mean, if you were planning on donating and I said, I'm not going to beg for donations. And so you're like, okay, I get to spend this money on crack. Thank goodness. Don't spend it on crack. Please donate. There's a button on the site, but I'm not going to beg any more than I just did. All right. Is that okay? Sure. You're, you're doing this thing with your hand on, on, across your throat. What does that mean? Do you need a lozenge? <laughs> Good night, folks. I'm Big Anklevich. And I'm Rich Outfield. See you later. The Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine is published under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial No Derivatives License. You may share these files with anyone, but you may not charge for them or alter them. The Force is strong in this one. Take two. What is that? What is what? Oh, uh, it's a squirrel. A squirrel. Ah, that's a pretty good picture. Yeah, it walked right the freak up to me. It was curious about your nuts. <laughs> Tried to get its hands on my nuts. And I said nay. One thing uh, that you can also do, if you would... You can take this audio, crinkle it up in a little... And, and you caught me in a particularly foul mood today. So it's, oh, I'm sorry, let me rephrase. You put me in a particularly foul mood today. So uh, there may be some good stuff. <laughs> oh, there you go. Constable Frogmore. Constable <clears throat> Frogmore ate one of those. <laughs> Cockroach cluster. <laughs> Anthrax Ripple. Can there possibly be somebody named Frogmore somewhere? You think? That's a real last name. Probably. I mean, Popoka, yeah, but... Obviously, you have a problem. Otherwise, you wouldn't have accosted me at my evening tea.
God, you're fat. I, I can't help it. It's thyroid problem. Oh, all right. I'm sorry. I, I'm trying this East End thing, but it's not sticking with me. Badger. Badger. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Michelangelo. <laughs> There you are. Nasiatal is how that said. I remember we said it. Seriously? Nasiatal? Even though yeah. it looked like Nakatal? You know, it's weird. I Should we do it over? No, I just have one um, of the headphones is out. <laughs> so I'd never hear you. I, I don't even know. Let oh. me double check just to make sure you're actually... Speak real loud. Hello. Yeah, you're coming through. Okay. So, Freaks me uh, out. Hello. Well, we should hit Walmart after this and get you another headset of headphones. Oh, I've got some around if I look for them. Come on, we'll use the money we would otherwise have given Rich. <laughs> there you go. Westcott. Have you got a Westcott? Oh, is that lovely word? Oh, I guess say the F word. Do you know? I didn't use the F word then, did they? That's a made up word. This is the According first... to every Western I've ever seen in the last 20 years, they, oh, they, they knew used the, it the all F-word. the way back then. This is the uh, first recorded use of it, actually. You ready? Really? He invented the word. Wait, wait. <laughs> this is alternate history. Oh, well, see, that makes it more plausible the first time it ever happened. Who's doing the voice of the Thundered Man? At Jeez, as if Rich can hear me. He can't hear you? I guess, he, well, I don't know why I would ask him a question. Um, because he can't answer. It probably doesn't matter. He can hear you, though. That's cool, right? I'm just saying he can hear you because you're talking into a mic and he'll get the recording. Oh, scheme! And he is? Grimbaldi, Lopino Grimbaldi. I mean, I thought you see this. I talk just like big Anglish, always talking. You're English. I'm from Manchester. And you know that how? The accent beneath the garlic. So, a man can be from Manchester, is that the crime? <laughs> no, but cutting a man and bleeding half certainly is. I didn't kill him. I've used the cabinet a hundred times. And in that... What cabinet? That piece of shit over there. As far as we can tell, it's just a box. That does sound like Manchester. Yeah. You know, if you're not a mank. You're a wank. True words were never spoken. What cabinet? Did you say that before? I did. Because oh, okay. the first time I sounded like Shatner. What cabinet? Spock, that piece of shit over there. What was the trick, Mr. Grimbaldi? Sound activates it, I presume? The trick. What was the trick? It's a good story. I still haven't read it. I have no idea what it's about. Okay, let me re- <laughs> let me rephrase. This is a good story. I'm glad I bought it. <laughs> I'm supposed to have hoisted Grimbaldi up by his cravat. I'm going to do it again just in case and do a grunt. Right. Of hoisting him. Hey! Huh. Ah. Whoa. <laughs> the hiccup at the same time as doing that. Uh. <clears throat> I'm getting it every time now. Drink. We have caught on tape the final performance of Sir Big Anklevich. Uh, <clears throat> <clears throat> Maybe I'm just going to have to skip doing that. Popoka breathed a quick prayer of his own. I have no idea how to do this. Say, like, see what the goodly Felucci. <laughs> okay, will do. <laughs> see what the goodly Felucci. <laughs> That's enough, chum. Drop the peppy. What's a peppy? Le Pew? I think it's a little pistol. That's it, right? All right. Now, let me double check. He did send us a new email today that said... Let's double check our own asses. Sorry. All right, then. There is nothing we won't try. Never heard the word impossible this time. There's no stopping us. Cut it out. Author's note. Strange Fire of the Sundered Man. <laughs> Third story I wrote with the character Ulrich Popoka. It's a bit nastier than the other two. Do you, do you think it'd be okay if I did that voice for the... Probably not. Author's note. Well, Strange Fire of the Sundered Man 
is the third story I wrote with the character of Ulrich Popoka. No, just read it normal. We're already casting aspersions on his character. We don't need to make fun of him. He demanded we cast aspersions or suggested we do so. Yeah, there you go. But Rich knows. Was this the first episode that Rich produced for us? No, Rich also did Tupac Shakur and the End of the World. Oh, well, F him then. That's right. That was what episode? Uh, Let me see if I can remember. Type, type, type. (laughs) <laughs> cheat, cheat, cheat. You'll never find it. Never. <laughs> I'm sorry. Do you need me to edit that out? <laughs> I don't know. It's up to you, man. You're the one in charge of this end of the show. I know, but recently I've had bleeps. Uh, Sometimes I'll put the bleep where it's under the actual profanity so you still hear the profanity. And I wonder if that offends people. And then other times where I just, you know, we don't actually even say the word or we actually cover up the word with the bleep. Uh And I wonder if, you know, if there's a difference between sort of editing. Stay. Bark, bark, wagtail. Good boy. Good boy.